Okay, so just to remind this, the afternoon speakers, we're going to do the same thing that we were doing this morning. Uh, when you are within three minutes of your intended stop uh, time, this gentleman right here will be waving that piece of yellow paper at you so you will know that you have three minutes remaining. And we decided to leave the cattle prod at the CBR for, uh, for today's event. So we've got a series of quite interesting talks this afternoon. As you will have noticed from what we were doing this morning, this program is really designed to kind of range across a collection of different sorts of things to think about when one is working in blood research. And this next presentation was added to the program because one of the things that is important for all of us as researchers to consider is what actually happens after we've made that great discovery. Where, how does that discovery get adopted? Uh, what is involved in getting to a point where you will find your discovery in a hospital near you? How is all of this structured in terms of the creation of, of, uh, of health policy, decisions about where to go with healthcare uh, aspects in Canada. It's, not, it's something that wet lab scientists don't think that much about, so we intentionally wanted to have an opportunity to expand our minds this afternoon. And to that end, uh, Dr. Jason Sutherland has, has graciously agreed to come speak with us. Jason is an associate professor in the Center for Health Services and Policy Research, fondly known as CHESPER which is on the UBC campus. You guys who walk from the CBR to the bookstore will walk right by his building over and over again. Uh, Dr. Sutherland has uh, recently come back to, uh, to Vancouver on a full-time basis after having spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, taking on a role with the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., uh, working on various aspects of, uh, of health policy and clinical practice in the office of the Assistant to the Secretary for Health Policy and Evaluation. Uh, so he's, he comes with a very rich background in both health policy uh, in Canada and also in the US. So we're really looking forward to hearing from Jason. He is also a scholar of the Michael Smith Foundation. And uh, his talk today will be entitled Funding Healthcare in Canada, the Pitfalls and the Opportunities. Jason. I think, there you go. Thank you very much, Dana. Before I get going, I'd like to thank everyone for the kindly invitation to come and speak at your conference. As I like to gauge the effectiveness of my uh, work by recognizing how many people I know in the audience. And I think there's only a very small few today, so I think I'm in virgin territory. So this is a wonderful opportunity for me, so thank you very much. I'll try and... Uh, uh, be hitting on all the main points with regard to Canada's healthcare systems that operate independently within the provinces and try to provide some context for you to understand as you move or view your role and then try to view it in the context of the entire healthcare system that operates and it's a very vast machine and I'll use some examples to try and draw some of that out this afternoon. So I'd like to start off by this graph. This is just pulled off the OECD website, the statistics. But I'd like to highlight the point, although it's a couple of years old, the trend lines have slowed down in terms of their relative increases. The relativity between the countries is still intact in that Canada is one of the highest spenders on healthcare services in the world. And this is probably not news to you all working in the industry. Nonetheless, it is important to keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, in terms of absolute dollars, we're talking well north of 214, and the Canadian Institute for Health Information projects this year we'll spend over $250 billion, or over $6,000 a person on health services, health care, across the continuum. Now, what does this mean for the provinces in which the health systems operate? Health care is eating everything, okay? It is crowding out forests, it is crowding out tourism, it is crowding out the teachers. Okay? It is now, proverbially, in all of the provinces, getting very close to the health, half of health care budgets, uh, half of the provincial budget devoted to health. So this is a lot of money. So there's a lot of money. What do we get in terms of that money, $250 billion? We get essentially this. It's probably not a farm in Saskatchewan that we get, but we do get silos because as an artifact of the history of building Medicare, we have constructed independent silos in the delivery system. 
We have a silo for hospitals. We have a silo for residential care. We have a separate silo for drugs. We have a separate silo for home care and so on and so on. And they do not talk to one another very well or very effectively. And those of you with experience with children and or elders or yourselves through the healthcare system understand how it breaks down in the holes or the cracks between the silos. So I'm going to articulate this in a number of examples today. But first, before doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how healthcare is funded, that big piece of the $250 billion. So first, a lot of money is spent on hospital-based care by the provincial healthcare systems. They are by and large funded with global budgets. So what that means is they are given a single envelope of funding to provide all of the care to the patients in their hospitals for treatment, irrespective of the nature, the complexity, or the volume of patients that they treat. That is a global budget. So it operates separately from the volume or the case mix of the patients that they treat. There are no incentives for the hospital to really ramp up the volume, hence wait lists, because that increased costs. And what happens when hospitals go over their budgets? Well, if they do it systemically, usually more than two years, they could all get fired in the C-suite. Okay? That is one of the practical outcomes. Then the ministry will assume their debt, or the hospital or the region will assume their debt, and so on. There are no push and pull incentives to get patients out early because the other silo on res care and home care doesn't operate on a system whereby they are incented to get patients out of the hospital quickly either. So what kind of a dysfunctional system or what benefits does this dysfunctional funding mechanism give to the provinces and the regions? Well, it gives them cost certainty, predictability. Those are big words in Canada at healthcare systems. On the other hand, we have the physicians by and large, with some, some, some exceptions, depending on the provinces, paid on a fee-for-service basis. And on fee-for-service basis, what do you do more of? You do more work to make more money. Okay? How does that intersect with the incentives of the hospital? Why do you think the physicians are always railing against the system? Well, because they've created a system whereby we try to reduce costs by having these structural barriers in place so they can't do too much and we can control costs on a fee-for-service basis. Moreover, there are no incentives for providing the most effective care versus least effective care. So they still get paid the same, irrespective of the quality of safety for which they deliver it. Moreover, it's not aligned with what the residents of the region or the provinces need. They have a medical license, they can do whatever they want. With some boundaries, of course. So, drawing it back to the state of affairs, over the last decade or so, hospital budgets have increased about 5% a year. That's a lot. That's certainly more than my paycheck has gone up. Nonetheless, we carry on. We still see very significant wait lists and demand for additional health services irrespective of the sort of cost constraints. So why is this? The very political issue, you see wait lists, wait times for your hip and knee, your cataract and what have you in the news all the time still. The literature is showing us that physicians can modulate in most cases for non-emergent surgeries modulate the demand on the wait list to reflect their target income that they want to have. So if you increase the access, they'll just do more, but they'll also, through their clinic, keep the demand pipe full. Okay? That's the kind of system we've developed. Now, if I pull that back to articulate in the context of international healthcare systems, which I had the OECD in the beginning slide, well, what kind of value are we wringing out of these systems relative to other countries? And for those of you that have sort of looked at the literature comparing healthcare systems internationally, the Commonwealth Fund runs annually a study that surveys in depth thousands of people, residents of different countries, 11 of them, and now it's up to 14 in 2015, looking at different aspects of their care. And here on these bullets, I have listed the domains of care for which Canada ranks last. Safe and coordinated care, 
timely communication, poor access, access to specialists. We are last out of all the countries who are surveyed. And out of the 12 countries, we are actually 11th, right in front of the US, if that is our benchmark. So to bring this home a little bit more, I have a few examples. Here I have a regional variations, the septorhinoplasty. And if you live in Kamloops, no problem. Okay, that's the dark blue in the middle. Where the ENT surgeons do a lot of septorhinoplasty, they have really good access to the operating room there. However, if you live in other parts of the provinces, your access is much more controlled and you're going to wait a little bit longer. Nonetheless, I'm not in a position up here to tell you today that these regional variations are a bad thing. In fact, I would take the position we don't know enough about these regional variations to be able to make judgment on them, even though we have several fold differences in utilization rates based on where you live, because we don't collect information on risks and benefits for what patients decided to do and or why, their morbidity levels, how they feel about their choices, or even the outcomes, the effectiveness of the surgery. Bring this a little bit more closer to home, here we have in the mid early 2000s the national consensus around what quality care looked like for hip fractures. It was deemed to be a high quality care and improve outcomes post-surgically if you had your surgery within 48 hours of being admitted to hospital. And here we have the relative rankings of hospitals in British Columbia demonstrating the variability in attaining that threshold. Almost two-fold variation just for hip fracture between the hospitals. Okay? Now it has come down in recent years a little bit more, but it is illustrative of the fact that there are big differences in access to even the basic kinds of care for hip fracture, which is high mortality, high complication rate, post-surgically. And I also did a study in Alberta that looked at the discharge location for people naively dis uh, admitted to hospitals. So that means that adjusting for their case mix and their comorbidity levels, they were coming into hospital for a range of chronic conditions and adjusting for all those differences. Each dot on this turnip plot, this is what this is called, is a hospital. We have a seven-fold variation in the rate of placing patients in residential long-term care based on what hospital you go to, adjusting for all of the patient characteristics. Okay, so where you live and where you seek care will be very influential in where you are discharged to, and that may well be residential care. I'm going to give you one more example emanating from Ontario whereby we follow hip and knee replacements over time as they pass through all of the publicly funded health care services provided by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. We see that in Toronto, average episode for a hip or knee replacement is just over 16,000. But if you go north and or southwest of Toronto, you will actually see that the cost for a 30-day episode of a hip or knee care following discharge from acute care, you're actually about 13,000, 25% less. So the cost to the system vary 25% more depending on where you live. And we have looked at mortality and complication rates and they're not very different where you live. Okay, so the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health are looking at these statistics on a routine basis saying I'm paying 25% more here than here and I'm getting the same thing, why is this and should I do something about it? Okay. Some of the drivers here is that they have built specialty hospitals in Ontario and if you build a hospital it will be full the day after you open its doors. So we have specialty rehab hospitals where in Toronto 53% of the patients are discharged from acute care into inpatient rehabilitation. Does not happen anywhere else in the, ho in the province except a little bit around London and a little bit around um, Ottawa. Otherwise, they don't have these specialty hospitals and they send people to home or to home care. Thus, they're responsible for about 25% less of the spending. Nonetheless, the mortality and the outcomes appear to be the same. Here's a little project that we, we just had this paper published looking at the continual of spending on ischemic stroke patients for 90 days following an acute discharge. So we have an index event of a hospitalization for ischemic stroke and then we follow those patients across all 
publicly funded health care services across the province, irrespective of where they had it or what they had. We included physicians, we included the hospitals, the specialty hospitals, the long-term care and the home care, and added it all up. And you see very big differences, again, depending on where you live. Again, not big differences in outcomes or mortality or things like that or readmission rates. But what does this picture tell you? It tells me that there are 30% you know, variations in spending and the gap doesn't close which suggests those places that spend little in the beginning don't play catch up and substitute with more intense care later. Okay. However, in Ontario, they're looking at these things and going, this is absolutely asinine. What should we do about it? Health Quality Ontario convenes a clinical panel to determine what the pathway for ischemic stroke care should look like. And they determine that, among other things, there should be no alternative level of care days. The acute portion of the hospitalization should be not, not much longer than five days. And it should be admitted to home with intense home care services and not admitted into low intensity inpatient rehabilitation settings. And that's where you have that line. The horizontal line is what the clinical panel suggests what the pathway should be and that's what it's cost out. Well, in most of those regions, they're passing that within the 30-day barrier. So, we then match the clinical guidelines against their trajectories and say, wow, there's a lot of excess spending here if you just do what the clinicians say you should do. So imagine how crazy that drives the government. Okay? Glaring problems. I just showed you a number of very expensive problems that occur across the continuum and in hospital and in long-term care. Easy to see, really hard to fix because we have cemented these silos in. So ministries of health are going after these using, among different tools, funding policies. So they're looking at paying healthcare providers differently to get them to behave differently. And I have three examples drawn from British Columbia that they've done over the last five years that try to, um, try to make providers to behave differently to get more value from the healthcare system. The first is they move towards paying hospitals partially based on a per case basis or diagnosis related groups for those of you that are familiar with the term in that based on the condition of the patients whether or not they have diagnoses or surgery, surgeries during their hospitalization the hospitals remunerated based on that patient on a per case basis so the more they do the more revenues they generate. So <clears throat> a lot of noise about this few years ago in the press because people were very concerned that if you push people out of hospitals more quickly quality was going to go down. Fortunately here we have the mortality and readmission rates and we do not see a change in either of those important quality indicators. Fortunately. So that is the good news story. The other part of the story is that well medical patients their length of stays went really up. Counter to expectations However, on the other hand, surgical patients, their length of stays went down and the hospitals actually started doing more of them. Okay? So this is what the government intended to do with the funding policy in the first place. They wanted the hospitals to get their length of stays down and do more patients. Well, they partially achieved that for surgical patients, but not for medical patients. This was a big change. This is also contrary to what the literature suggests will happen in countries that implement a per case based funding mechanism for hospitals. By and large, what you see is hospitals start to do more to make more money. Okay. Simple premise, like it's like fee for service for physicians, but it's fee for service for hospitals. But it didn't really work that well here. And you gotta think why? Well, when we contrast the basis of the policies is that hospitals really only had zero dollars at risk because they were redlined. For those of you that are familiar with uh, budgeting in that they couldn't lose money from the initiative and secondly they were asking hospitals to do more but providing no incentive for post-acute care providers to actually respond all right so if you own residential care facilities and you're fully filled what are you going to do with more patients you've got nowhere to put them so you just say hey we're full sorry even if you want to get those patients out so when you have a hospital focused policy what do you think will happen Second policy that I want to bring to your attention is the ED pay for performance scheme that was implemented quite a number of years ago 
whereby when you show up and are registered in the emergency department, the length of time that you wait, there is an inducement for the hospital to have you seen by a physician more quickly. And I can't remember the thresholds. I think it's 2 and 6 and 12 hours, depending on your triage level when you present at registration. Small amount. Really, for most hospitals, only counted to $1 to $2 million per year, which is really a tiny drop in the budget for a large acute care hospital. Consequently, we have a publication showing there's no association with a reduction in ED wait times. So that one didn't work. I think it's still going on, though. Marginal pricing. The government, through the Health Services Purchasing Organization, set up a price list for surgical treatments in the health authorities and said, if you do this extra endoscopic sinus surgery or hip or knee replacement, we will pay you Y dollars. So if you do 10 cases, we'll pay you 10 times Y. This was an attempt to try to get at the unused capacity in the operating rooms in the hospitals or the believed um, capacity in those hospitals. What do you think is some of the fundamental problems with this approach? Do you think the government knows how to price health care? Well, no, they don't even collect that kind of data. They have a GL general ledger, which has the, the department level expenses. But if you actually try to bring all that together and say, OK, for your complex hernia repair, that's going to be $2,000, they don't have this kind of data, so they made that up. They made it up based on some proportion of a Canadian Institute for Health Information's approximation of a cost. However, what actually happened is the price for most of the surgeries was below the cost that they could do it if they were paying everyone. But if you did it, you squeezed that extra case in at the end of your day and didn't pay anyone extra, you might make a few dollars. So if you work harder all day and do an extra case, you'll get the money. It'll just cover your costs, though. However, concurrently, they were running an incentive program for hip and knee replacements, the orthopedics program. And you could run this thing at any hospital on Easter Sunday, paying people triple time and make money. They just didn't know how to price different kinds of surgeries. So disparity in access, anyone? Because if you're running a hospital, it's having a benefit are running a deficit and you have an opportunity to make money here to divert to patients over here, what are you going to do? You're not going to do your hernia, you're going to do a bunch of hip and knees and take that money and put it where you need it. Well, that's what I'd do, but then I'm not in charge. Okay, so the incentive programs, I went through three of them, have had, unfortunately, little to no effect in British Columbia. By and large, the programs were structured in a way that I feel were probably not poised to make significant changes in behaviors of the providers, notably the institutions, the hospitals, and some of the, um, the surgeons, surgeries and surgeons. However, it was largely discon disconnected from primary care and all of the other kinds of post-acute care. So I think without those kind of connection, you're poised to fail in terms of just changing one of the levers in the system without changing them all. Nonetheless, Ontario and Quebec think they have the answer and they're moving ahead more aggressively in British Columbia with these per case based schemes, and I wish them luck. Nonetheless, based on these examples and a plethora of others that many people have published over the healthcare systems in Canada, it's clear that we are making our system more costly and ineffective and less safe than we need to, and people are not using funding policies aggressively to try to change behaviors to treat patients differently. And remember, it's just a lot of money. It's $250 billion. Okay, tough after lunch crowd. <laughs> tough crowd. Okay, so what are other countries doing? Here's an exemplar in the United States, the Affordable Care Act. I've been looking at some of the implications of the uh, legislation in terms of um, enabling different kinds of funding policies, organization delivery systems, is working on many different levels to try to achieve different objectives. For example, they're trying to improve quality by not paying for hospital readmissions and or discounting per case basis if you're chronically poor quality. They're also paying for things differently rather than in a silo independently, looking at adding up all the silos together and giving providers one lump sum to figure out where the patient should be and making the providers work together that way. 
They're also paying primary care docs an incentive to what they call meaningfully use of electronic health records, not medical records, where it's silo specific, but a health record that transcends the different silos. Secondly, they're enabling different entities to start to work together. They're called accountable care organizations, medical homes, you've probably heard them, whereby different kinds of sectors of care are now able to work together to keep patients within that system and provide them the effective care when they need it. And lastly, they're working on trying to collect outcomes that matter to the system and to the patient, such as experience and outcome measures, function, pain, those kind of measures, which are currently not collected across the Canadian system in any sort of standardized approach. Nonetheless, I'll pull it back in or push it back out to an international perspective here. Countries are devolving into a bunch of different approaches to funding health care. Some of them might be episodic ver a, a payment for a period of time, including 30 days or 90 days in the United States, or they take it out to a year of care for cystic fibrosis in the UK, and they're expanding that program into different sectors now, chronic treatment. Netherlands is doing um, a bundled payment, but it's really a type of approach to paying for diabetes care for a year, irrespective of the setting or the provider type. And also we do have some other initiatives in Ontario and also renal care in British Columbia. So we see that there's a mix of scopes and services and setting over different times. There are lots of different options for provincial governments to consider. So both Ontario and British Columbia have integrated funding models for chronic kidney disease and some are now starting to push out integrated models for cancer. But other than those two, they are largely subject to the problems of these silos that I talked about otherwise. I recently ran a study in Ontario where we did mixed method interviews of different sectors of providers and their understanding of where there are unwarranted variations in the system and then back that up with analysis of administrative data. And if it turns out, and this is probably not shocking to people, if you sit down with healthcare administrators, they know where the unwarranted variation occurs, where that is excess spending that does not achieve effective health outcomes. You then go and look for it in the data and you can find it. So there are significant opportunities to align those qualitative assessments with quantitative methods and design policies to target it to try to get more effective and cost-efficient care. However, there are lots of barriers, notwithstanding many countries are attacking these barriers and they include, and the big ones are here, information sharing between sectors. Do you think the hospital talks to long-term care, that talks to home care, that talks to the pharmacy? No, it doesn't happen very well. Discharge notes aren't sent on or anything else is sent on. There's also the issue of privacy. Does your health record follow you and do you consent to having that information shared across sectors and between providers? Certainly that issue raises its head. And it's also coming up the very thorny issue of labor contracts and who can do what and to whom and to where and to when. So it turns out that there are a lot of financial interests aligned with the status quo of I can do this and do as much as I want and make as much money as I want versus I don't want the, that NP, nurse practitioner, to do that because it undermines how I make money now. Also, provincial governments have poisoned the relationships with a lot of their provincial medical associations, a lot of distrust between the entities too. So right now, the medical associations are not all on board with changing how their members work and the policies around how their members are paid because they're really not all that happy with how much they make, although they make a lot of money. Sorry, physicians. Clinical practice physicians. And the system doesn't do a great job of measuring outcomes that matter to patients. I think that should be clear. So, drawing this all back together summarily, are we at the end of the silos in Canada? If you contrast the provincial healthcare systems, what's occurring provincially, I would say yes. 
Notwithstanding that, the provincial health systems have not moved significantly in 30 years, so I am not all that optimistic. However, I was somewhat hopeful that new financial duresses would make them consider serious changes and I do not see that happening. An example would be right next door in Alberta. As the price of oils fell through the floor, we see the government taking the position that not overhauling the healthcare system to align with more value and we're going to respect all the institutions and labor contracts that they have and not that I'm suggesting that they shouldn't but I'm suggesting that people could work in different ways in different settings and differently to achieve the same things and or more effectively and I'll draw your attention back to the fact that the Canada is almost last in all of the important measures around access and quality of the healthcare system. So there are many templates to choose from. So provincial governments are not bereft of ideas. They just have to look around and they do. I see them down in Washington all the time where they're visiting Medicare and all the big hospital associations. What do we do now up in Canada? Here's our problem. We have global budgets and they get all these ideas and then they come home and they say, oh, that was nice, but it won't work in Canada. <sighs> Nonetheless, I think that given that funding reform and funding policies are occurring across the globe in countries like our own socially insured healthcare systems like in Europe, especially Northern Europe, they're adopting these integrated funding models. It should give us hope that some of those reforms are amenable to our context and can be implemented to increase the value of spending. I am not suggesting that we should reduce healthcare spending by I'm suggesting that we have the system work differently to achieve higher value for that spending. There are many opportunities to do so and the barriers are well known. We just have to be willing to have political courage. I certainly am not in a position to be able to do that, but I do belabor everyone I talk to, including yourselves, of the opportunities to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, really interesting uh, food for thought, Jason. And, and I, I was sitting here thinking to myself that there's sort of uh, almost like a, a dichotomous reaction in Canadians in that either we're, we don't want a, a negative word said about our healthcare system because mm -hmm. it is, it is it's such a, uh, maybe it's a way we see ourselves against the backdrop of the rest of the world. And at the same time, we're complaining about the fact that we're we have waiting lists and things aren't happening and you can't get in to see a specialist, et cetera, et cetera. How do, how do you see, as a, as a society, how do we drive that dialogue and how do we look at, at reconciling those two positions? Because it seems to me that that's one of the biggest things that's in the way of change. Yeah, I, I mean, there are, among the possibility, an infinite number of possibilities of approaching this, I would imagine. But I think primarily, um, you don't see in any of the provincial health care systems a st substantial amount of political courage to tackle these reforms. Even when the evidence is overwhelming um, and, and the provincial governments are under significant financial strains with regard to health care funding because it's gobbling up the dollars that they'd love to spend somewhere else. Um, and they're fighting against powerful interests of hospitals, physicians, and entrenched providers who really are, have, have invested their capital in the current system. So they have built up the structures exactly as the incentives were, and we were now asking them to pivot. And that, that is a very challenging thing for anyone to do at the best of days. I know that when I'm asked to do something different, I immediately say, why would I do that? That's more work. Um, because I have my own momentum, I suppose. Um, but to get to the heart of your matter, I, I would suggest that there are probably many different opportunities, but I, I would come back to the thought of, are Canadians prepared for the politicians and the healthcare sector to really reinvent itself for the next generation of Medicare? It's not clear to me that people are willing to invest the angst or to let the angst pass through the providers to them as they journey through the healthcare systems. I'm not clear we're at that tipping point. I do worry that what is going to precipitate a major upheaval in the healthcare system is a quality event where hundreds of people die. And then there's gonna be um, an inquiry or something of nature 
that really draws out the lines of these silos and says you can't have these anymore. I mean, Romano and to some extent the other, the, even the Naylor report was really clear about trying to break down those silos. And it really, I mean, the Naylor report was buried last summer. The Romano recommendations were really not well done either, or well implemented. So I'm not uh, so confident that really we're going to move progressively in that area in the next time. And this has nothing to do with progressing into privately paid healthcare. This is all in the public healthcare system that I'm talking about. So I'm a little bit uh, sagging about the opportunities that that provincial governments and ministries of health will actually change in a revolutionary way in the next year or two, unless we have the horrible disaster of a quality event. Hi, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of chronic care and, and um, interdisciplinary care and, and the aging population. And at least for a decade, I think we've sort of heard little snippets about almost integrated practice units in primary care here and there. But is, is it just that there hasn't been enough data coming out of that? Or is there just not a, a ground level movement to make those things happen, which have to be more efficient? And perhaps they're in smaller communities that can be translated into larger urban centers. But it just seems like a lot of the answers seem to be coming from the top down, the administration, you know, imposing that on the, on the patients and clinicians and, and the systems. Is there any success, any way of hoping that there might be success, some success on the ground that could infuse into um, pilots and, and, and successes sure. there? Well, you sort of opened up Pandora's box in about 10 questions, so I'll try and do the ones that I remember. Um, so primary care reform, as you point out, has been a hot button issue across the provinces for a good number of years. The reforms have been very active, especially in Quebec and Ontario. Um, I think really the only concrete numbers coming out so far are that the significant family health teams and some of the primary care reforms in Alberta have been a very successful vehicle for transferring wealth from the taxpayer to primary care physicians. So th that's bad, right? Unless your objective is to calibrate the primary care physician salaries with specialists so you don't see a drain out of the sector. But I'm not sure that they're sophisticated in terms of their health human resources planning to get there. British Columbia is new to the game and they are trying a bunch now and the data I think is still going to be emerging and we don't see it yet. So I can't comment on that. I do know people in my center are working on evaluating what happened or what is happening on the ground in the new primary care reforms. So. De facto reform in primary care does not mean better and in integrated care. It depends how it's done. Um, however, the literature suggests that you do need funding policy and funding to follow or to support kind of practice changes. So <clears throat> they are trying to align funding mechanisms with trying to provide these integrated teams and I think the evidence is still very much out there in Ontario. They move towards this capitated model, which means you get a set fee for the number of patients you have on the roster, provide the entirety of their primary care for a year, and it was not effective. And I think similarly in, in Quebec as well too. So, you know, I'm a little bit worried of what we're going to find in British Columbia was a similar transfer of wealth from the taxpayer to primary care docs, but it's possible it will work if it's in the constructs of a supportive system, but I don't see that yet because they're not reforms happening in the hospital and post-acute care that would really make all this happen. And insofar as doing more primary care or doing primary care differently in its own little silo is going to fix the system, I, I'm a little bit suspect. Just a question. You mentioned this very briefly, but you didn't talk about it. You know, we, we don't really live in a fully public system. We, we all know there's private money, there's private processes, there's private activities, there's all kinds of services available. Mm -hmm. Internationally, I think we see a lot more of that than we see in Canada. You know, we've got this, this Canada Health Act that nobody wants to dare go near, but I mean, could you say a little bit about what, what do you know or what do you think about the role of, of a mixed system with, with some private and, and public monies? Sure, I think insofar as that is uh, involved, the evidence is fairly clear. The development of a parallel system undermines the public system by drawing resources from it and degrades the quality of the public system. I mean, we look at examples in Ireland, Australia, and other systems. I, I mean, it's fairly clear. 
Jason, um, you benchmarked with the United States with the Obamacare, but um, but you made a comment about Northern Europe um, being sort of making some headway. I'm not sure if that's the word you use. So why uh, why can they make headway? Are they a little less uh, recalcitrant to change? Is the culture different? Um, are 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 our expectations too high? Well, you're asking a lot of a health services researcher here rather than a sociologist. Um, I think certainly there is a higher sense of togetherness in a lot of these different sectors I know certainly from the published work in, in Denmark where the care is community based and there instead of institutionalizing or putting elders or, or a higher degree they have a lesser degree of institutionalizing patients or people in residential care that there's a sense that we all should look after one another a little bit more so than in other countries but I don't know I mean whether or not that is the underlying reason and I think it's really hard to tease those things out um, but I'm probably not the best person to comment on that fully thank you very much thank you